our schools have been open since September, but we still have 30, 40% of our kids who haven't been in the classroom for um, nine months. We've got a lot of catching up to do, and it's a chance to make sure that wasn't a lost year, we can build off of it. We really got to think about how you get the final 30% of the people vaccinated. They're often people of color, or they're just anti-vax or vaccine hesitant. And uh, I do worry that we have more vaccine in the next month. We may have to stimulate demand a little bit. A lot of the younger people may say, hey, it's over. I'm Karen Tumulty. I'm a columnist who writes about politics here at the Washington Post. And I want to thank you for joining us for this, the latest installment in our series, Coronavirus Leadership During Crisis. And we are joined this morning by Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont. Welcome, Governor, and thank you so much for joining us this morning at Post Live. Good morning, Karen. So, Governor Lamont, we are we are now a little past the one year mark where I think just about every aspect of daily life has changed. What do you think you have learned about leadership during crisis? And what do you wish you knew then that you know now? We sure as heck know a lot more uh, now than we did then. Uh, back then, uh, we were all scrambling to uh, catch up. Um, and, you know, Washington, there's no stockpile. Um, hydroxychloroquine. So we as governors had to take the lead uh, in our own states. Um, I think if I learned one thing is I can't mandate that you wear a mask. And if you don't wear the mask, I'm going to fine you and there'll be an infraction. I mean, we've tried to do that, but I had to work through persuasion. I had to um, help people understand why we're doing what we're doing, why it was important that um, your kids stay home for a period of time and uh, learn by Zoom because it was unsafe in the classroom. You know, by the time we did something with the classrooms, I'd say that 90% uh, had already closed down. Uh, same with restaurants. Uh, bars, we did have to close down. That was, um, that was a little more um, uh, transactional. But I had to uh, lead by persuasion, explain to people what we were doing, why we were doing it, and if we changed our mind, why we had to change our mind. Well, Lately, there has been a little bit of wrangling between you and your legislature over your emergency powers that were granted earlier, early in the epidemic. First of all, can you just describe what we are talking about when we're talking about emergency powers for a governor? Yeah, Karen, let's go back, um, you know, almost a year ago when there were no um, surgical masks anywhere to be found. And we were scrambling, uh, you know, calling China, calling everybody on the supply chain we could find. So uh, we had to put in place executive orders um, that the legislature, I only do that with permission of the legislature, might add. So we didn't have to have a formal RFP process and um, we could uh, accelerate things. You know, more recently, uh, we've been moving our testing vans, now our um, vaccination vans. We have to get access to parking lots and public places. We have to do that very quickly. And um, so there, I, I'm very thankful the legislature has um, uh, given me some executive authority to make these decisions quickly on a timely basis um, when we need to. And, and that's been extended, I think, until um, the middle of May. And yet uh, you're facing some resistance. You've recently won in court on this. And, and you're not the only governor um, in Ohio, for instance, we're seeing some of the same things. What do you think is going on politically right now in these this tension between governors and some of their state legislatures? Well, we have three equal branches of government. And uh, you know, in most of our cases, the legislature has not been in session for many, many months for reasons that people understand. Uh, here in Connecticut, they have been in session for the last three months. Uh, so it, it's certainly their prerogative to step up and say, um, I don't think we should have masks in classrooms or I want bars to be able to stay open until three or they, they have the right to step in if they think I've um, overstepped the bounds or they don't agree with what we've uh, what we've been trying to do. 
Uh, so far, they haven't really done that, uh, but I'm trying to keep them involved as best I can. I need everybody rowing in the same direction. And over the last 12 months, uh, I think uh, here in Connecticut, we've been doing that. Business, labor, the hospitals, Republicans and Democrats, it wouldn't work unless we spoke with one voice. Well, of course, you know, not everything is in the rear view mirror yet. And we have a question uh, from one of our audience members, a constituent of yours, Tracy O'Neill, who asked with new variants and therefore cases on the rise in Connecticut and throughout the country, do you plan to continue full reopening? Uh, these new variants, I think it's reasonable to expect more cases from them. Yeah, no, they are. I mean, especially down in New Jersey, New York, I've seen this movie before that UK variant is highly infectious. The good news is the vaccines work. So um, we've got um, the vast majority of the people over the age of 45 here in Connecticut vaccinated, uh, at least for their first shot. That has meant that our um, hospitalization is not, uh, you know, we've got plenty of capacity there. And I was really pleased that the fatalities have gone uh, very low. We had one fatality yesterday, by far the lowest in our region. And uh, that's because we prioritize the people who are older, people who are the most vulnerable, and that's where um, we've made a difference. So that said, I don't think we have to, um, look, we're still wearing masks, we're keeping social distancing. Um, we're doing things that I think uh, help depress the potential spread amongst young people. But I don't think we have to turn backwards. Uh, we've got our, our stores and our schools open, and I think uh, we're going to keep them that way with the mask. You know, a couple of times you've mentioned that your neighboring states, New Jersey, New York, one of the things I think that is has been sort of different from the, in the way that Connecticut has handled this is that it really has been kind of a, a regional effort. Um, what are the pluses and what are the minuses of that? Have you found that that limits your own flexibility at all? Well, early on, we work very closely together. Look, there's no borders when it comes to uh, COVID. Um, and is, maybe you don't know, but it really was down there in New Rochelle and New York. Then it spread into New Jersey, came right up Metro North. Um, so when New York uh, sneezes, we do catch cold. So you're right. I talked to Phil Murphy and Andrew Cuomo uh, to the south and Gina and Charlie in the north. And I said, um, how do we work together on this? Let's speak with one voice. It doesn't do me any good if I close down bars and, um, you know, Andrew Cuomo keeps his open. Then all you got is people driving back and forth. Uh, so we did work um, very closely together, especially during those early months. You know, more recently, um, you know, people are have different vaccination strategies, have reopened cautiously, but uh, we're still a region. And your vaccination strategy has primarily looked at age, and there, you've gotten some criticism for that, you, you know, not comorbidities. You, um, you're pretty narrow in your occupational um, openings of, of, of the vaccine eligibility. Can you talk a little bit about what your decision making to be so heavily focused on age? Uh, because that's where 90% uh, of the complications are. That's where 90% of the uh, fatalities are. So by prioritizing age, we got a lot more people vaccinated quickly. You know, people in other states were playing games. You could go to howtojumpthelinecom You could come up with, uh, I used to smoke in college and get ahead of the line. And uh, all of a sudden, some senior was not at the head of the line and suffered a fatality. So we kept it really simple. We did it uh, by age. I think that made an enormous difference and saved hundreds of lives. But how do you answer the criticism that you've gotten from organizations like the ACLU and the NAACP who point out that, you know, there are certain communities where this disease has, has stricken more heavily? Well, believe me, uh, when it comes to uh, underserved communities, black and brown communities, folks who uh, can't go online to get their vaccination, we are bringing the vaccines uh, right to those communities. Uh, we have a mobile vaccination ban. We actually have dozens of them. And uh, starting today, because today it's open to everybody, regardless of age, um, we're going to be going in there. And in many cases, if you get an appointment, bring three or four of your friends with you. We want you to get vaccinated. We're making telephone calls. We're knocking on doors. We're bringing the vaccine right to the homebound. So 
We're not just waiting for you to come to us. We're coming to you. Well, looking at the other end of the age spectrum, one of your big concerns right now is kids and specifically kids and school. You've you've talked about your worries that, you know, something has really been lost with uh, with the amount of disruption of the education system. One of the things you're talking about doing is extending the school year into the summer. How soon are you planning to make an announcement on that? And what are the pros and cons as you're thinking about this? Let me back up for one second. I mean, when COVID was hitting a year ago, uh, first, all the calls into our hotline were, you know, am I going to die? Then it was, where's my unemployment? And then, Karen, it was kids. You know, we call it quarantine. For them, it was isolation, just the distress in their voices. They hadn't seen a friend in a long time. So, yeah, I, uh, I wear that on my sleeve. I work my heart out to get our schools open in September. And the vast majority of our schools were open for in-person learning as they are today. But that's not good enough. We still have 30, 40 percent of our kids who just don't feel confident going into the classroom, haven't been back there, often in our urban communities. So uh, we're going to make our announcement within just a couple of weeks about how we have, um, you know, free summer camps and access to museums and aquariums and ways that um, young people can get back in the game. They'll be doing some learning. They got some catch up to do. But it's also going to be fun and it's also going to be socialization and a chance to get ready to be learning again in September. So uh, you're going to have a short break in around July 4th, then we'd like to see you again. So are, are you finding that you, during the, before January 20th, you were describing the the process of dealing with the, uh, with the Trump administration as herky-jerky. Um, are you noticing much of a difference with, with the Biden team in charge? Yeah, um, I, I am. Look, um, we have a year of experience under our belt, so we're in a better position to be less herky-jerky, but they've been very uh, thoughtful about this. Jeff Zients and his team. The first thing I was representing all the governors, Bill Lee and I, said, um, don't tell us what our vaccine allocation is going to be a few days in advance. You know, I have to set up uh, football stadiums, other places to be able to distribute it. So they've given us three weeks notice. That made an enormous difference for every governor across the country to be able to plan accordingly. So um, we're, we have a weekly call. It's, uh, um, we help to set the agenda. Um, CDC, Jeff Zients, uh, all the team is there, FEMA, to answer our questions. And um, uh, I, think, uh, I think people are seeing real progress. And I'd like to think that everybody across the country is going to have that first shot within a couple of months. So when do you think that life is going to begin to feel like something that resembles normal for most people? Well, um, I've had my second shot. I got to tell you, it's pretty liberating. Uh, I, I, I ate indoors at a restaurant for my first time in many months. Um, so I'd like to think that uh, come this summer, uh, especially outside, you're going to have a new normal. I'd, I'd like to think that you'll be... Um, going to a, a sports contest, sitting outside. Uh, maybe if you have a little distance from another group, you don't necessarily have to be uh, wearing the mask. I surely like to think that our kids are back together with their friends socializing. I think that as more and more of us are vaccinated, when we're together with others who have been vaccinated, um, you know, we, we can relax a little bit, but not yet. We still have, um, you know, about half our population that has to get vaccinated, uh, not to mention uh, the younger people under the age of uh, 18, 16. So we got to hang tough a little bit longer. So you say it's now fully open or I mean, everybody's eligible to be vaccinated. Is is that correct in, in Connecticut? Um, That's correct. Who, who do you so? Where are you hitting the resistance um, and what are your challenges? It's one thing to be eligible to be vaccinated. It's another to have access to the vaccine and also to be willing to be vaccinated. How are you addressing those concerns? A little bit of a barbell right now, Karen. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, some of the urban population, black and, black and brown communities, either there's some hesitancy or it's a question of access, getting the vaccines to folks, uh, giving uh, them incentives to do that. 
some of the younger population, maybe some of the young guys say, hey, I, I don't need it. Uh, I'm not sure I needed a mask. I'm not sure I need to get vaccinated. So those are two communities that we're really going to make a big effort to uh, get vaccinated, make it easier for them to get vaccinated, make it cool for them to get vaccinated, make sure uh, their parents and trusted um, folks they maybe listen to uh, urge them to get vaccinated. Are, are you seeing any sort of, um, I don't know the right way to describe this sort of politically based resistance to the vaccines as, as we saw in, in wearing masks? Uh, the, the polling shows that, for instance, Republicans, conservative Republicans are less likely to be open to it. Is, is that something you're seeing out in the real world? And how do you overcome that? Uh, look, I, I've certainly seen those polling numbers. I think it's a little less true in New England. I think it's a lot less true in Connecticut. Um, yeah, I had some people sue me and say, uh, you can't make me wear a mask. It's none of your business. But I'd say the other 95% of Connecticut said, um, I understand why we're doing it. It's not about me. It's about keeping you safe as well. Vaccine is the same idea. If the mask was defense, the vaccine were playing offense. And um, so I'm, I'm feeling pretty confident that um, people are not going to be using the vaccine as a political club. People will be getting vaccinated. Time will tell, though. Well, I'd like to turn to another topic that's that's right in front and center in the news, which is uh, which is the president's big new initiative on infrastructure, which really infrastructure is almost too narrow a word to describe the the many things that are in this package that he would like to see get through Congress. You have already issued a statement that you're in favor of it, but can you describe what right now are Connecticut's most urgent needs? Yeah, we have a transportation system that was built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. It's a, we're an older state. We have uh, old infrastructure. We had a bridge collapse down in southern Connecticut just there 30 years ago. I mean, it just fell right down. So, uh, A, there's a certain urgency to uh, make things safe or a state of good repair, as they say. B, we're, um, people aren't traveling as much as they used to, but let's face it, Connecticut's location between Boston and uh, New York City is really key. So, the degree to which I can get faster rail service, faster automotive uh, back and forth, it makes a big difference. You know, and in the, in the other days, you ought to have broadband, you ought to have fast access there. Um, we have really good broadband distribution, but in some of our urban areas and some of our smaller towns, not yet. So I'd like to think that um, you can get the same internet access in Brooklyn, Connecticut, as you can in Brooklyn, New York. And that's part of what the infrastructure plan from the president allows us to do over the next uh, eight years. And how important is it going to be for governors, mayors, local official, officials to be um, outselling this plan as well, because we're already hearing resistance on Capitol Hill from, you know, Republicans in particular saying this is too big, this is too expensive, it is not focused enough on infrastructure, it's essentially a liberal, you know, wish list. Mm, yeah, I guess. I also see them standing there next to that bridge that's about to be repaired and, uh, uh, and say, well, I didn't vote for this bill, this is a bridge I really want to see repaired. But you're right. I, uh, what, this is what breaks my heart. I, I'm somebody who believes in government, believes the government can make a difference. I think this is a time for my state. It can be transformative. And uh, I want to make sure that this money does not go to waste. I do not want, um, I have 169 towns. I don't want 169 earmarks. I don't want this money to spread around like peanut butter. I want to have five or six really important transformative uh, things that we do. Uh, starting with our transportation infrastructure, starting with our kids, starting with uh, you know free daycare for uh, folks to allow women to get back into the workforce. So at the end of year two, people can say, all right, I think government did make a difference this time. And, and what about some of the other things that are there in the bill? You know, things of addressing climate change, um, it, things, just a lot of other priorities. Do you think this bill is really focused the way it should be? Look, it's okay by me. I mean, um, I, I saw one of the things you may say this is a little weird, but you've got a lot of our cities that have been cut in half by the uh, trans by the highway system. Look, I like Ike, but t turning our splitting our cities in two is very damaging. So 
These are the type of investments that we can make, whether you call that infrastructure or not, it makes our cities whole, brings them back to life. But look, uh, I, I'd like to see this be bipartisan, uh, Karen. So if um, Republicans and Democrats are sitting around the table, they want to fine tune this, God bless them, but let's get it passed. And what about the tax increases that are anticipated to pay for this? Um, you know, Connecticut, <laughs> Connecticut has some of the, you know, highest highest earning Americans in this country. No, that's right. But there's no such thing as a free lunch. You got to pay the bills. Everywhere I go, like I said, people are standing there saying, thank you for accelerating my rail service, but I don't want to pay for it. And uh, we got to figure out how we do it. We can't put this on the on the backs of our kids and grandkids. I want this to be an investment that we make. So, uh, you know, I, I think the president was right. He put a way to pay for this on the table. If um, the legislature or Congress wants to come back and they think a carbon tax or a mileage fee is a better way to do it, step forward, but don't show say, I don't like the way you're doing it, find another way, let's get together. And and do you feel that well, way as well about the, um, increase in corporate taxes, because that is also going to affect a lot of very powerful and important players in Connecticut. Uh, it will, but um, if the money is well spent, if it's invested, if it allows us to grow our economy, put uh, millions of people to work, we have an expanding GDP. That's one way that we can uh, keep down the deficit as a percentage. And I think a lot of our corporate citizens uh, understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. But I just don't want that money to be wasted. I want to make sure that we make really strategic investments. And what about, you, you mentioned jobs. What about the types of jobs that we're talking about for the future? Um, can you sell, for instance, uh, addressing long-term environmental concerns, uh, climate change as a jobs program? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think a lot of the 21st century jobs are going to be in and around uh, the green economy. I think that makes a difference. Here, I'll tell you what we're doing. We've got community colleges. They go for two years. A lot of people don't graduate. Um, we're going to compress that. We're going to have a 16-week certificate programs on being a laser welder or energy um, home efficiency. You're going to get a certificate at the end of 16 weeks. We pay for your childcare, daycare while you're going through that program, and then we get you a job. So I'd like to think that we're going to use this as an opportunity to get a lot of kids an opportunity who otherwise might not have an opportunity. Tough thing to do when you have 8% unemployment, but this uh, infrastructure bill gives us that opportunity. So Governor Lamont, in the little bit of time that, that we have left, I'd like to ask you, I mean, to sort of reflect on this moment we are in. Um, we're coming out of a crisis unlike anything this country has ever had in its history. Uh, we have a president who used to describe himself as a, a sort of a transitional figure. Now we see, you know, such big initiatives coming out of Washington. I mean, what is your sense of where Connecticut is positioned right now, where the country is positioned right now, not just looking back at the year we've been through, but looking forward to the next decades. Yeah, Karen, I, I, I want to seize the moment. I mean, I'm from a state with old infrastructure. We haven't added a lot of new jobs. They raise taxes. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to change that dynamic. And uh, I think we've already begun. And I think um, you know, the rescue plan and now uh, the infrastructure is going to make a difference. And look, I'm a I'm a business guy. I, I built telecom systems most of my life and I was a little skeptical about government. And a lot of guys leaning on the, the mop or something. And I was um, but now I think this is an opportunity and I think state government has shown we can make a difference. Um, people all of a sudden realized um, what why you have a Department of Public Health. And what that means when our teachers stood up and allowed kids to learn uh, remotely via Zoom learning for a period of time. And then our daycare people coming back to work right at the height of the pandemic so that nurses and doctors could keep going. I, I think it's given me a new appreciation of the power of government, what a difference it can make. And I hope it uh, gives folks that were like me, you know, hey, I'm going to take a second look at government. Let's see if they can get it right because we need to make these investments. Well, Governor Lamont, I want to thank you so much for being with us here today on Post Live and hope you'll be back with us soon. 
Appreciate the chance, Karen. Take care, everybody. Thank you. And please join me next Tuesday, 9 a.m. Eastern, when I'll continue our series, Leadership During Crisis. And I will be interviewing New Hampshire Governor Chris Sununu about how the Granite State is dealing with the coronavirus. You can always head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and find more information about our upcoming programs. Thanks again.